Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the cloud-based authoring tool for e-learning. Learn how your team can work together better at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. Hard not to be having a good time on Wednesday morning, folks. How many of you are dancing along or drinking a cup of coffee or tea? All you folks in the chat out there. Chris, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing very well. It does sound like there's a mixture of folks. Some are hearing and some are not hearing the music. Uh, okay. Apparently there's a function that some of might be on you. Some people are hearing it though, so I don't know. After last week's weird crowdcast of visually and this week. Oh, so many mysteries. So many mysteries yet to explore. Technology, we love it! <laughs> <laughs> well, fingers crossed. Well, at least the people can hear the people, so that's very good. Very, very and they good. can read each other in the chat, and everybody's having great weather, it looks like. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Dale says I had to tap an unmute button. So, yeah, I guess we're all adjusting to this new version of Crowdcast. It's a new thing yeah. that we're all, we're all learning. But, hey, guys, learning new things is really what we what we want to do anyway here on Instructional Designers and Offices Drinking Coffee. Hashtag idiotic. <gasps> Big breath. <laughs> no kidding. Um, and so this week we are learning something new. And to help us with that uh, functionality, that function of learning something new, we have Jenny Winsek with us. And Jenny, it's your first time with us. So introduce nice. yourself to our gang. What's your superhero origin story? Oh, man, that's going to take a long time. I'll keep it super short. Um, but yeah, I'm Jenny Winsek. I am a DHS trusted tester and I've been and I'm also in e-learning. So I've been doing e-learning since about 2013, I think. And um, and I got certified about two years ago for the, the trusted tester program. So that's a whole little short thing. <laughs> very, very cool. <laughs> and, and geographically, where are you joining us from today? I am from Atlanta. Okay. So we're in Georgia today. Right. Oh, I'm seeing yes. mention in the chat about the earthquake this morning. I was scanning my Twitter feed mm. and I had a whole page worth of people from LA who I must who obviously I have a bunch of follow a bunch of people from LA, um, mm -hmm. but they were all having reactions to the earthquake. It, you know, it, it was like, Whoa, something big going down in LA. Wow. Uh, and so anyway, it was just like freaking like the whole stretch of my feed all of a sudden was uh, was this LA react or the uh, earthquake reaction. Hey, I, I we don't have a lot of earthquakes here in, in Ottawa, but we do mm -hmm. have snow. You guys get a little <laughs> bit of snow up there. <laughs> oh, hey, surprise. We actually got snow in the desert. Whoa. I know. Yeah. It's the weirdest thing seeing the little snow flurries coming down over the cactuses. Uh, Very cool. You know, it happens at least once I'm or twice. I'm not going to ask if your horse has a name or not. Um, that's, a, I think, a discussion for another uh, another talk, another day. But, <laughs> sorry, that might, be, that might be a really bad dad joke um, going on there. So, <laughs> anyway. uh, guys, we have a real thing that we're going to talk about here today, um, and it's accessibility um, and TTT. -T 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 TTV5 and trusted testing and, and, and those sorts of things. So, um, mm -hmm. Jenny, maybe just give us, uh, you know, an introduction to, to what this is all about then. I mean, you mentioned okay. that you are, um, you know, a certified, you know, tester. So let's, let's get into what, what that's all about. Yeah. So, um, so actually, I guess I'll go do give you all a little history mm -hmm. on it. I think that's Perfect. pretty good. Yeah. So back in, I guess, the late 1990s, um, there was a big movement, I think, worldwide to get accessibility into IT. Um, so Section 508 um, was an amendment to the Rehabilitation Act here in the U.S., and um, that required all federal agencies to, uh, you know, make their information technology accessible. Um, and then the global WCAG standards came out, I think, about a year later or so. So um, I think some years later, the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, um, got together with, I think, some other government agencies to just finalize or not finalize, but to kind of unify how to apply yeah. the, the 508 standards. Um, and so that's how the Trusted Tester Program was born. So now we have you know, a unification of the understanding of the 508 standards, the testing processes, the 
uh, yeah, the testing processes, how to implement it, how to report it, tools. So that is just, that's the, that's the Trusted Tester program. I guess a really short blip about yeah, yeah. it, so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I once heard an LMS vendor refer to SCORM as the standard that isn't. Um, and, it, mm. and, and I think of 508 um, and even WCAG to a certain degree also because they talk about what should happen, but they're not always very great at making sure that we know how to do it in a sense. That's mm. my experience, mm. you know, with it, that there are there are a lot of goals that, that you know, should be, alt text should be an equivalent, et cetera, but then we have to figure out through other resources, et cetera, you know, how to write good alt text or how to, you know, how, so how to, how to make sure that we're doing all of these things. We even had a question on our, our Domino community earlier in the week. How do I mm -hmm. make sure that my content is accessible? And the answer was, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thing, uh, because there's so many, you know, there's so many, you know, wrinkles, uh, you know, to it, et cetera, too. So uh, and like mm -hmm. both Joe's throwing in also historically, each browser decides to do something different for their users and not up here to standard at all. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about that for sure. Yeah, Chris, you mentioned the WCAG. There's a question in the chat that we could just jump to really fast. And he, um, uh, David's asking, what is the Canadian equivalent for 508? And so would that be the WCAG? Is that or I, I, did, I don't know. Go ahead. Yeah, so at Ottawa here, um, I'm not sure what the um, what like maybe the federal if the federal standard if there is a separate federal standard for instance the way that um, in the U.S. it's called out under six, Section 508. Uh, I think most people do point though to the WCAG. Um, Lydia from our team is pointing out the AODA um, in Ontario, but I'm um, mm -hmm. but that's also a lot about like physical space etc. Too, you, you know, architectural related things and, and that kind of a thing. So. Um, I, really, we, we, I think most of us here just anchor in the, um, in the, in the WCAG because it's kind of the global, and you know, it's the global spec, the global, um, the global thing to point at. Uh, so. so what would the difference between the two be? Are they, are they, I just kind of assumed they were kind of two different standards bodies that they each came up with their own way of doing it. Is that not right? Um, I think they're actually very similar. Um, I'm. I know that um, the, I think the DHS website, I can probably link it, um, has the comparisons between the WCAG standards. They're all in kind of a different order, um, but yeah, the section 508 also has very similar things. It's very interesting. They are very similar for like what to test yeah. for, what to look for. I guess really what I should say to look for, um, but let me see, I should have that here. I can link it below. Um, oh no, yeah, some somebody from the chat will probably drop it in. Mm -hmm, okay, wink, wink, yeah. nod to the chat. <laughs> 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 yeah, somebody will do it. So, um, yeah, so so the accessibility stuff, let's talk about some of that. Um, that the like why the program, has the program actually always been around or when it first came out, did everybody just have to interpret it themselves and kind of figure out how to test for it or what's like? Yeah, so I, um, yeah, so I think again, like when it first, when the whole section 508 thing came out, it was, they didn't have the standards. I'm not exactly sure when the trusted tester program was made. I think it was probably around, I don't know, at least like 10 years ago or so. They did a big overhaul in 2018 and revised a lot of stuff. So that's why we are on version five now um, for, and this is mostly for just web accessibility versus like software and stuff. But, um, but yeah. Uh, so that's, that's, the ten, that's the TTV5. That's the TTV5. Kind of yeah, right. Yeah, because I was yeah. I, I put that in the title because I was hoping people would be intrigued and go, what's mm -hmm. TTV five? So that's yes, <laughs> trusted tester version five. Yeah, there we so, go. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is that the? So I mean, one of the questions we wanted to talk about today uh -huh. is, um, you know, is the trusted tester program the best way to go about mm -hmm. testing for it? Or actually, um, is it? there are many ways to do testing. So section 508 is not, or the trusted tester program is not the only way to test because there are, you know, we do have like our WCAG standards, we do have like other things, but um, if you're working for 
the federal agencies here in the U.S. It is, I think it's probably one of the better ones because when you have the trusted tester certification, you can, um, you know, the government is like, okay, well, Jenny is a trusted tester. So her certification or her, she has the seal of approval that she can put on it. And it's great for, it's great for that. But, you know, there are other ways to test. Um, this is just one way to do it. And stop. Yeah. Gotcha. So when you're becoming a, a trusted tester, how does that happen? How do you get that designation? So, so you go onto the DHS website. It is like, I think literally just dhs.gov. You can go there. It is a free certification. So that's super awesome. You, uh, and it is self-paced. So you go on there, you sign up, you have, I think you have to wait. There's a waiting period to see, um, I think if they have enough spots for you to be in there, um, then once there is, you can just start taking it. I think the website says it's about 85 hours or so, like minimum to do it. I think I probably took mine in about, I don't know, like three months to do, but that was like on and off for working in between. Um, but yeah, so you just take it. They go over, you know, what's what is Section 508, what is accessibility standards, um, you know, how to use the tools. Because so they provide, I think, two different tools that are also free tools that you can still find, um, like Andy and the Color Contrast Analyzer, and then um, and then you really get to like the you really get to like the meat of the the learning, which is you know all about you know, all of the standards that they have and how to test for the standards. So they'll provide like, here's how you look for, you know, keyboard accessibility. Here's how you look for like how, if the forms are correct or if the heading levels are correct. So they, they teach you like literally everything on how to do it. So it's really awesome. It is again, free and super great. So everybody can learn. Um, and I was just going to say like, that, that's something that everybody should make as part of their maybe like instructional design career path and professional development. You should get certified as a trusted tester. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. And if also, if you don't even want to, to get the trusted tester, there are so many free resources and stuff out there too. So like it's, it's everywhere. I think, again, the DHS website has a really great one, Section 508, the W3C for, uh, you know, who published, you know, WCAG, endless resources. It's it's awesome. There's so much good stuff out there. Mm -hmm. Very cool. It might. Um, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I mean, you've mentioned a, a couple of tools. Um, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe we should skip over to skip to looking at one or two mm -hmm. of those. Right Let's now. do that. Okay. Yeah. How, how some okay. Of works in the... Uh, how some of this stuff works in you. Okay. All right. Let's see. Let me share my screen. Oh, that's right. well, while you're setting that up, I, I um, mm -hmm. I'll just, uh, I always like to kind of dial things back in case there's folks in the, in the chat or hanging out with us that maybe aren't really too sure kind of what we're talking about, but when we're building uh, e-learning, right. Or any sort of technology learning content that's technology based, we want to make sure that everybody, can have access to it, hence the term accessibility, and mm -hmm. making sure that those with disabilities, I think is where it first all started out, supporting uh, folks with disabilities. But then we can also think of, and this was something that I learned over time, that it, you know, disability means a lot of different things. Even just getting your colors right is important, mm -hmm. you know? the you know, the things that I would first think about, and maybe a lot of you folks in the chat do too. I don't know. Let me know. Maybe I'm just an old guy that just can't quite figure this stuff out. But as I was going through and learning about it, my first thought was it was like the deaf and blind. And what are some of the things, the multimedia you can add to adapt for those folks who have those types of, of disabilities? And um, but it really is a lot more than just that, right? It's not it's not just it's not just that. There's there's uh, color blindness and and trying to you know deal with all of that. Yes, thank you, James. Um, and uh, I mean, and there's a lot more, but I'm just kind of filling some time here for you. But now that I see we got the screen up, we can figure out how to solve for these issues. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, Andy, actually, um, let's see, 
Yeah, so here, Andy was made by the, I think, the Social Security Administration. It is a kind of like a booklet uh, or a favelet, I think is what they call it actually here, um, where you just, oh, I can't point to my screen. I have to show you on the screen. <laughs> um, so, so you drag this, the Andy button up in, into here, into your bookmark, and, um, and it'll save. And then all you got to do is click the little Andy button, and he's there. So Andy does stand for Accessible Name and Description or Description Inspector. It is a free accessibility tool, um, and it goes over all of like these different modules in here. So it kind of, I would say, replaces a screen reader. So you wouldn't have to go through, you know, tab through or you know, enter through, like all like the different things to just check and make sure. So you have all of, again, all of the um, you know modules here. So our focusable elements our graphics, you know, links, buttons, structures. Um, it also, I think there are two other tables that'll pop up or two other modules that'll pop up if they're there, iframes and tables. So it'll take a look over everything. So since we're on the graphics and images, I can show you, uh, we can take a look at our, the Google About page and take a look and see. So right now uh, it's picking up uh, a few images actually. So let's see, let's go back. So we've got this one, our first one here. Um, that is, you know, the little Google Doodle. And the uh, what the Andy output is will be what the, the screen reader should say. So, you know, it says here, here's the an illustration of a frog wearing an astronaut suit standing on a smiling moon. <laughs> That's so cute. The frog is happily pointing at a shooting star. And then it goes in and says what the text is underneath. So the text might not even be there per se might be part of the image, but that's really great that they still have the text underneath for what it says and how to learn more about the content. And, and from a technical perspective, when mm -hmm. somebody that's doing e-learning, what you're seeing, when it says Andy output, I just wanna make sure I equate this correctly for everyone. When we say alt text, when we're telling people that you should add some alt text for that image, that's what's showing up as this Andy output? Correct, yeah, your alt text. Yeah, so whether it is, yeah, just frog, on moon or or something more specific. That's usually what we want to do, especially if it right. relates to the content. If it's something super totally random, like, I don't know, that just doesn't relate to the content. Um, I don't necessarily think it has to be, but it is always good if you are never sure, just put the alt text in. No, no worries. So, yeah. Nice, nice, That's yeah, it. good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, just want to make sure that everybody is uh, is is tracking with this, you know, with the different terminology. Because I know different different platforms like this will say one thing, and you might look at that and say, "Andy, output." Mm. What? Uh, my my authoring tool doesn't say, you know, output. It says alt text, and so just mm -hmm. making sure that's that's the same thing that shows up for everybody. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there we go, and then. Um, Let's see, what else would we like to take a look at? Um, I'm, it, mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing, and it's hard for, I don't have a super big display, you know, here going on, but it says uh -huh. accessibility alerts 16. What's it telling us there in the black bar? Yeah, so um, there are all of these other alerts. So I guess we got the improper RA usage of 10 misuses of alt attributes. Um, that usually should go if you, click the links, it should say probably what is going on here. Um, so I'm to sure. be honest, uh -huh. I was just gonna say, I'm shocked that Google has any alerts at all. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So I think some of these, some of the, since we are in the graphics and images, um, and actually the Andy website is perfect, it will tell you kind of what errors are, but because this one here is probably a button, or I think maybe like in the, CSS, I think, um, uh, it'll, it'll be read somewhere else. So it's okay. thinking, you know, Hey, you, you do need to check these things. Like just take a look, make sure it's not wrong. Um, but these should be, you know, said somewhere else or, um, or it's just like pointing out, I think the different things like, uh, oh, I don't know. Um, Oh, so probably some of these uh, these Google images are hidden from the screen reader. So it'll just show us what those things are. Maybe they're not, maybe Google didn't think it was necessary for people to know what every single gotcha. image yeah. was perhaps. Yeah. But um, 
Yeah. Yeah, because I, I know I know a lot of times when I um, when I get to a website or something and I just happen to be using the you know um, uh, read this page to me. I was testing that out a while back, and I remember mm -hmm. uh, being on a web page and it was reading like literally everything. <laughs> like it was reading the mm -hmm. hashtags. It was reading you know all of the text, and so I I think. And I mean, I don't know, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but um, mm -hmm. this is this is w a way that you can tell those the reading devices and things like that, which things are the important content. And then the other content that's on the screen is just there for like admin purposes or whatever. Like, like for example, the mm -hmm. copyright at the bottom, I, you know, we don't need the the. The, maybe it's not on this page, but on a lot of pages, there, there a lot of pages there ends up being this a big copyright thing at the bottom mm -hmm. or an about thing that maybe just doesn't need to, you know, go through that reader, uh, mm -hmm. or somebody, you know. So maybe you 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 hide it so that it doesn't show up there and that only the important things get translated. I don't know, but mm -hmm. I, I, I guess that's a design issue that we have to start thinking about as mm -hmm. as developers of internet content and in making it accessible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh goodness. Yeah. Yeah. So, Richard's, <laughs> no, Richard's asking in the chat just to confirm. So, so what okay. those warnings and stuff that we're looking at, so, so, he says, so these are warnings versus accessibility killers. Yes. In other yeah, words, warnings. it's not failing. It's just saying, hey, something is mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah. Out. Take a look at it. Yeah. It's just telling yeah. you, you know, sometimes there are like manual things that you have to do just mm -hmm. to make sure. Cause yeah, some of these things might be, or and these warnings I think might be either yeah, something that we would have to take a look at and just confirm or deny whether it passes or fails. Like I think right. definitely this one might be in, maybe let's try like links or something. So it's in a link, so that uh, works. Okay. Yeah. So it's yeah. because of the, the, because of basically kind of the filter that we've got set up there, it's seeing mm -hmm. something, but really when we switch the filter to, to something else, it's actually covered off and, and taken care of. Right? Yes, cool. and, I, and I will say like all of this, Andy still confuses me sometimes, and but really having the the experience because the trusted tester program does go through that. It does like help mm. so much of trying to learn what these things mean, and of, of course the website also says. But you know, so I would just say I, if you are confused, it is okay. <laughs> you know, the, Melissa makes a much clearer point than I was trying to make. Mm -hmm. She says, better to hide decorative images from tab order rather than adding alt text. So we reduce audio clutter. I love that yes. term. That, Melissa's that's, got it right. That's what I was trying to get at, the audio yes. clutter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. Oh, and, and, I mean, self-serving bit of info here. In Domino 1, we do have the ability, um, as you're working on your page, to take decorative elements and mark them as um, as outside of the tab order, basically unfocused so that the, the, the user with a screen reader doesn't see that it doesn't need to see that there's a line that's offering no no communication value, merely visual decorative you know, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we can uncheck those and um, and that makes that whole experience a lot cleaner for a screen reader user. Um, mm -hmm. There's also been a discussion in the chat about drag and drop, <laughs> because you know us mm -hmm. e-learning e types, we love our we love our drag and we drop. love a good drag and drop interaction. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not sure about drag and drops. I think. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I, well, I, given that given that they are something that has a spatial you know relationship, um, and that mm -hmm. largely I think in most cases you know. Are something that requires vision you know you need to know where something is and where it's going to go yeah. it's, it's not a uh it's not a good accessible experience although some folks were talking about having actually tried to achieve it using keyboards but it's a pain to to, to, to build etc mm. so, yeah mm -hmm. dale is saying they can be made keyboard accessible but it is hard kim saying it mm. was a tedious process to be sure um mm. yeah I, i'm i'm not gonna hmm. for me and mm -hmm. this is this is chris on his grumpy guy um dragon drops, my my own feeling is that unless you are um having people carry out a task that is spatially related i find uh drag and drops make me kind of annoyed in the in the mm. experience um uh, i feel often even just as an adult that i'm being asked to do a child's game for something um etc et but that's me anyway. I tend to look elsewhere for or, or other things, to add, realistic things for people to do rather than dragging words into to, to, you know, boxes or something like that for 
So, and Tracy, you're very much correct. It is, is it is audience dependent, and I'm in, in this case, I'm saying me as the audience. <laughs> Um, you know, but, and again, if you were trying to assemble parts in, you know, in a certain order, you know, for something, you know, mechanical or something like that, brilliant, put them, you know, boom, 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 etc. But the way that we usually use drag and drop is we, we couch it with, well, it's interactive and it's engaging, but I, I feel that in a lot of cases, we're actually treating adults like children. Ah, <sighs> I'm glad I got that off my chest. Um, <laughs> do you feel better now, Chris? Yes, I do. Chris, Chris, what do you really think about this? Right. Anyway, yeah, no, for sure. There are awesome use cases for it, but it's also something that we often, I, um, clicky, clicky, bling, bling, and I'm completely dropping who I owe credit for that phrase to. Um, oh, the, oh, it was right on the tip of my yeah, tongue, I and now I can't I'm think going, of it. Too. I'm going to apologize, but we have a tendency to put shiny objects into things that don't necessarily serve the learning process very yeah. well. Yeah, I often tell people when they ask about that, um, because you can do a hide and show based on certain things, right? And so if you have somebody, you could set up your e-learning to be like, if it's to test for accessibility and whatnot. And if it's somebody looking at it on a, on a desktop with a reader or whatever, uh, have it hide the drag and drop and have it show a different interaction in its place for the mm -hmm. for that particular course or for that particular mm -hmm. page or whatever you know there's a lot of different little things you can do but again yeah. it just adds more to your development time and and stuff like that so sometimes it's just best to go with what's accessible to everybody and we can't make good designs doing it well and, and barbara points out in the chat um clients get extra excited about the shiny objects but we do have a responsibility to make sure that um, we are raising things like accessibility with clients. You, you know, we want what you all want, you know, the cool the, and, and, and the wow. And, and that, you know, that's always exciting. We love making these things too, you know, right. But we do have, uh, you know, have to flag that, hey, that's great. But, you know, there are sacrifices that get made then, you know, yeah. certain kinds of things in, in some places, some areas. So, yeah. Yeah, Jim, James is saying shiny stuff without instructional design equals pet rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Sounds about did, right. Did we have another tool to take a, a look at? Yeah, so let's see. And I think I saw some things in here talking about or asking about color contrast analyzer. Yeah. So I was just going to say, yeah, let's do that. Yes, yeah. So this one is awesome. I really, oh, that's my snipping tool. That is not, that is not, <laughs> uh, here we go. There we go. Okay. So here is Color Contrast Analyzer. So this one is also another free tool um, that they go over in the Twisted Sister program. So we have this beautiful uh, thing here. So we're going to take a look and see. Um, we're going to test some of these colors here. But down here, we do have the WCAG results. So we are on 2.1 um, for, I guess, WCAG standards. We have the contrast minimum, which is the double A level. Um, so, they, you know, when you go through and, you, you, you know, you can go and, and learn all of this stuff. So I think sometimes at minimum, you know, you want to get double A. If you really want to go hard on accessibility, go for triple A. So we are going to take a look here. We have our foreground color up here in the black and we have our background color here in the white. So we're going to see here. Yeah, there's a quick question in the chat, and I kind of have oh, the yes. same question. So, is the is the color contrast analyzer part of Andy, or is that a different widget? It's a completely different widget. I think Andy okay. does have a color contrast thing here, but most of the time it's just like manual test needed. So, I think it's uh, kind of smart enough, but it just usually just says, "Please just do this one on it. your own." Yeah. Okay. So it is a separate tool. You don't need Andy for this one. Okay. And now is that is that uh, like a Chrome widget that you just add into your browser and then you just fire it up? I'm not familiar uh, with it, so I don't know. Chris, have you ever yeah. used it? No. No. Let's see. Um, there might be. I I saved a bunch of these tabs so I could remember, but now I don't think I remember where it is. I think it is just I like downloaded. It's okay. As long as we have the name, I think everybody will be able to find it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so at least how to use the, how to use it. I don't know why it's very, it zooms in very, very deep. So you can see what, what we need. And so um, we're going to go to, I think this bright orange color here. Okay. Take a look at that. That's our foreground color. And then we're going to come down to this one here. 
and we're going to find that background color, which I think is this one. Okay, and then you can see the example text here showing like what it's going to look like, and it does pass for regular text and large text at our minimum um, for our contrast uh, for level three or yeah, level three, it fails the regular text, but I think that's like when it's smaller, um, like if, if this whole page was probably a lot tinier, um, but it, this looks, this looks, it's fine for the large text. And then if you are perhaps developing, um, this tool is also really great for that. If you're trying to find like a really great color, like scheme or color or something, and you're just like, oh, well, this, this orange is too, is too bright or it's too dark or something let's like kind of just see so you can come down here to the alpha or even like switch the colors using this button here and uh and just kind of move it down hmm. so this one just passes i think they must have made it really really bright bright just bright enough to get this interesting thing here so you can see it fail when i when i move the alpha down just and point that's actually, one that's that's actually very cool because not only is it telling you that it, but it's giving you the chance to then resolve that by adjusting the set and understanding that as opposed to having to go make an adjustment and then retest nice time saver there that's very cool mm -hmm. yeah i love to use this mm -hmm. one when i am doing the developing and i'm just like well let's just kind of see what colors go together like it's just super cute so <laughs> so yeah it's perfect i love it well yeah. it's also nice too because because it may not actually, it may not actually change the color that much to, to shift it from it was um, it, it it wasn't working, but then you drop it down to a couple numbers and then it does work, and it maybe changes the color a little bit, but it doesn't like ruin your design, like, so mm -hmm. to speak, right? You know, like I think a lot of people are like, oh, but I really wanted to use orange and it's failing. But it could still be orange, just maybe not as bright of an orange. Or maybe if you mm -hmm. adjusted that background brown a little yeah. bit less brown or a little bit more brown, it would actually make it then pass. So you get yeah, to be able to play with those numbers at such an intricate level, I think, is very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So there we go. Color contrast analyzer. Mm -hmm. Yay. <laughs> It's I, I'm actually kind of psyched that there were so many people in the chat early on that uh, talked about it and that actually know about it. Um, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a good sign. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, I was thinking even as we got started and you were, you know, Jenny, you were mentioning like the history, you know, the initial stages of 508 uh, and et cetera. And, you know, for the longest time the, when, when we were talking to client prospects, et cetera, here at Domino, we, the only people who would ever raise 508 or accessibility, you know, it uh, initially were government um, agencies who have, you know, mm -hmm. um, a legal requirement for that. But we find it, um, and this is a, absolutely one of the best changes in our in our industry, is that it is now something that many, many more organizations ask about as part of their, um, you know, their process, etc. Mm -hmm. Learning about a, yeah. a tool, etc. Yeah. And, and that's just that's that's really quite awesome. They uh, that they, you know, it's become a commoner thing. It's not everybody, but it's it's it, it is like I say, it's not just exclusively a question raised by people who are mandated or have a legal you know requirement in, in that same way. It's, mm -hmm. it's becoming broader, more broadly understood, and that's so important. Yes, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. What else do we have? Another another tool we can uh, take a look at, or oh, let's see. I think I think those are actually those are the only two that trusted tester. Um, like requires uh, yeah. use oh, cool. for. So it's just the Andy and the, and the yeah, CCA. Yeah. So that's all I've yeah. got. David's got a great question. Is the design yeah. approach to accessibility sites are generally static? Let's say adding, oh yeah, 3D. What do we, how do we, do they have a thing for that? Is that on, um, like would that just be, would 3D just be an image? I guess, yeah, I don't know. Um. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure. So I guess. Oh, the three D models. I, yeah, I guess it would just um, be an image if you're just taking a three D model and putting it up on the screen. But if it's an actual interactive three D model that you can like mm, spin and turn. Yeah. That might be. Um, huh. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one. I don't. My the the trusted tester program unfortunately does not cover the three D models. Mm. Um. So I'm not sure. I still have a lot more to learn too. Um, on accessibility, of course, it's always 
always growing and always expanding. Yeah. There's always more things to learn. So. Well, for sure. I mean, I guess, I mean, I don't know. They probably haven't even figured out virtual reality yet, but I mean, I don't know. Mm. If, I mean, how are you going to be able to make virtual reality accessible? If somebody can't see, how are they going to put goggles on and be in a 3D space? You know, mm. that kind of stuff. So it's like some of the technology, there's only so much that can be done. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Uh, VR accessibility, like TV show accessibility. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know, Joe. Yeah, yeah that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. That's definitely something to look into. I think that's actually pretty, <laughs> pretty cool, actually. Yeah, James, so. James says Fed will no doubt ban VR and AR for oh. that reason. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Um, Buzz yeah. is asking oh. a, a neat question. Um, yeah. you know, what about video? Does Andy t do a test, any testing for that, or are there standards that, for video that exist um, uh, outside of WCAG since it's also a standalone medium? But yeah, I mean, yeah. What the, at least I mean, we know, I guess, about the basics of, of you know providing closed captioning. But are there other things with video that we need to think about? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. So actually, um, in my in the training for the, the trusted tester, we do go over videos. Um, it is mostly manual, so we won't need to use the Andy, uh, Andy for it. Um, yeah, so yeah, I think it is just making sure that, and this also can apply with audio too, making sure that if a video or audio plays automatically, the user should be able to get to it within three clicks, like using like a keyboard, should be able to get through it within like three tabs um, to get there to turn it off. Um, audio descriptions are pretty good if you can get them in there or, you know, if like something is happening in the video, like, you know, you're going through and it's just like, oh, um, you know, the user, uh, like a sighted user can see, you know, that it is, you know, a pan of like nature and stuff. And so having the audio description that says, you know, we're going through, I think like developers can make that and stuff of just like, yeah, having it be heard. Uh, yeah, audio descriptions are heard of just saying, you know, the camera pans through like a tree or something. So that's mm -hmm. usually good to have too. But yeah, all of like videos and audio and some of those things are just manual testing that that we all can take a look for. So right. cool. Mm -hmm. Nice. So I'm um, from a uh, yeah video. Uh, it's excellent one. And somebody mentioned about transcripts. Is that really the only thing we can do is have transcripts? Um, yeah, having transcripts as well can also be really great if you're not able, I think if you're not able to get, um, and maybe perhaps don't quote me on this, um, but if you're not able to get the audio descriptions into the video, even just putting audio descriptions, you know, as like, you know, in a word text or a word doc or something, some text that in the transcript is also good to, you know, if there are important things that need to be either read or seen, um, you know, a screen reader can always do that too, so. Yeah. I think. So transcripts are awesome too. Another way to access access the same information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what are some of the challenges as we sort of get close to the end of our, our time? I'm curious yeah. when you're going through and doing this stuff, like what's the hardest part about about you know trying to be accessibility conscious and and doing and yeah. this work and testing for this stuff? Oh man, I think I think a lot of it is actually subjective. So while we do have all of our standards and all the things we need to look for, it's just like, you know, um, there. I have another colleague on on the team who is who's also um, a trusted tester, and so we'll we'll get together if I'm just like, hey, I'm kind of confused about this thing. Like, let's say something simple like a heading level or something. You know, I'm like, oh, I think it should be a heading level one. I think it describes this. And she's like, oh, well, maybe it should be a heading level two. So things like that, where it's not, it's not necessarily going to fail. It could, could potentially fail, but sometimes it's just really subjective of just trying to figure out, like, I know, you know, here we have like some, some people saying, you know, maybe transcripts are great or, you know, but not required or something. So everything is just very subjective, just trying to make sure you know, the user does have the best experience possible, I think is like, is great. But yeah, like sometimes it can just be kind of hard just trying to figure out how to make it the best way possible or how yeah. to do even, something. So even alt text can be so subjective, you know, yes. what, what is yeah. really, uh, you know, helpful um, mm -hmm. may not be quite obvious to us. Um, even small things, you know, it, it 
and so I'm trying to remember, I had a vague example that's rattling in my brain, but to, mm -hmm. you know, how much information do you, is actually helpful and what kind of information you know, is actually helpful um, yeah. in order for people to understand and get the, the learning value in our perspective, the learning value out of, um, out of alt text. So mm -hmm. um, it can be. Um, well, there's got to be resources out there on how to write good alt text. I can't imagine that somebody hasn't written a blog post or an article about that. Well, yes, yeah. I mean, there, are, there, are, there are lots and lots of uh, places where you can go. But even, mm -hmm. you know, even then, um, yeah. um, so, so here's, here's a, I guess what's it triggering, triggering a little bit as mm -hmm. I've, um, uh, the last couple of months I've been playing around in the, um, in, in the Fediverse. Um, mm -hmm. using Mastodon and, and the Mastodon is very, very, the Mastodon user community is very mm -hmm. um, aggressive uh, or, or, or like strong about making sure that we're putting an image up, there's alt text and, and it makes it actually fairly easy compared to say, you know, you know some of the other, other tools, etc. So I will often, when you, when you look at an image, you'll see the alt text, but just the sheer variety of how people are describing things um, is, is just fascinating to see who's you know you've written this and what are you describing and and um and just the different kind of when you start thinking about oh well i'm reading this but if that's all the information that i have that's different than how maybe somebody else would have written it and what you know uh yeah it's very subjective but uh, i mean there are some obviously yeah. some some good guidelines etc but it's it's a really I, i'm a words guy too so that you know it's all fascinating to me <laughs> that kind of a thing so if it's just something as easy as is it too much text or is it too little text like is there like is there maybe not a standard but like a best practice right like like would we you know when you talk about giving presentations people say you know seven to ten words in a bullet point or whatever is is the max you should go or seven plus or minus three whatever that uh old wives tale is uh, <laughs> i mm -hmm. don't know exactly but you know something like that i mean i i don't know and then like you said i, I think it's i think like everything else it depends right <laughs> yeah and dale has thrown a, a really awesome resource in there um the w3c schools mm. alt, alt tag decision tree there's a wonderful link there so and that's actually new to me i clicked it and i'm gonna check it out too nice uh, so yeah and and i uh, as we uh i will mention because we don't always do this but if you're listening to the audio podcast version of this you can come to the crowdcast recording later on and see all of these links in the chat Although we'll do our best to um, to scoop some of these out and include them in the blog post that we do every week, summarizing um, the show as well, just to provide you another place to do to, to find those folks. If, as I say, you're you're listening to the audio version tomorrow mm. on your on your drive home, I'm saying you're listening to it tomorrow, but for you it'll be today. So I, I don't know how to compute how better. <laughs> anyway, <that's the> <laughs> Jenny, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it's Thank time you for to wrap having up. me. Take a second and uh, and post any contact info that you want to yes. share into the okay. chat where people can find you, that sort of a thing. Folks, don't forget, um, the reason we're able to gather here every week for instructional designers in offices drinking coffee is because of the sponsorship of Domino Learning Systems, makers of Domino One. For us uh, here at Domino, accessibility is a really strong and important thing. We have some actually built-in features. I've thrown some chats in there. Um, so, but if you're interested in learning more, uh, do check us out, free trial, all of those kinds of things. Can I impose Hit that back? green button down at the bottom there. And yeah, there's a green totally button check right there out. too. Yeah. <laughs> Mash that green button. Is that what school kids say in these things? That's yeah. Right. No kidding. That is what they say, right? And just while we're chatting, before we're closing out here, we do have a YouTube channel. This will go up on the YouTube. You can subscribe to it on Google Podcast Play. Apple, all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, that's our outro. Thanks, everybody. Jenny, you were fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Bye, everybody. Toodles, gang. See you all next week. Let's just dance a little more. Everybody grab a screenshot.